Hello everyone, today we're gonna to be talking about seven different energy sources that you can use in spell work. And we're also gonna be talking about some tethering techniques towards the end of this video as well. This topic was chosen by my channel members and if you are interested in becoming a channel member and getting all the perks that come with that, I will leave a link down below in the description box. Prepare yourself because this video is going to be very information dense. So if your brain is starving, you've definitely come to the right place. I'm gonna have timestamps on the bottom of this video, of course, as always, so if there's a particular particular type of energy source that you're interested in listening about, go ahead and jump to that section. Also, my dog is joining me for today's discussion. But anyways, let's talk about why this even matters. Why do we care about different energy sources in spell work? There are many different reasons why people choose to work with various different types of energy sources, but the biggest reason, in my personal opinion, why you'd want to start working with energy sources outside of yourself is because it helps you do bigger spells more efficiently. If you've ever cast a spell and you felt totally, utterly depleted at the end of the spell, that typically means that you used way too much of your own personal power and not enough of external energy sources to help you you fuel that spell. So it's really helpful to tap into these other energy sources to help power the spell to accomplish bigger things, to be more efficient in your magical practice, and also so that you're not so exhausted after doing whatever spell work it is that you're doing. So we're going to start with the basics. We're going to start with the earth as the first energy source. And this is something that I did discuss in my energy manipulation 101 video. I'm going to link that video down below because it does discuss how to center, ground, and direct your energy and your probably going to need to know those things before going into the rest of this video, so definitely check out that video if you're not familiar with those concepts. But starting with the earth, this is the type of energy source that I always recommend to beginners. It's typically the energy source that you find in Witchcraft 101 books. This is not a new concept, but before performing any sort of spell work, especially in witchcraft traditions, most people advise beginners to ground their energy to the earth. So what you would want to do, you want to start by centering your energy and again I'm not going to really go through that whole process in this video but you start by centering your energy and then you find that point of contact where your body meets the floor this can be your foot on the ground it can be your butt on the seat it can be whatever is touching some sort of concrete ground below you and it doesn't have to actually be the earth like you don't have to be sitting on dirt you can be sitting in a chair in your second story house you can be in an airplane you can do grounding practices wherever you are and it doesn't matter Matter, but find that point of contact so that you can focus on it. If you are someone that can visualize, what you typically want to do from this point is visualize roots extending from your body and creeping down through the earth's crust, through all the different layers of sand and rock and lava, all the way down to the earth's core. And in the center of the earth, there's typically some sort of warm, inviting energy. And so you want to focus on that warmth and pulling that warmth up through your roots all the way back into your body. So there are many different guided meditations that can take you through a process like this. If you are someone that can't visualize, you might want to focus more on tactile things. So you might want to focus on that point where your body hits the floor and then also bring in some earthy elements for you to touch during that process. So literally get a jar of dirt to work with when you're wanting to ground yourself. You can rub it between your fingers. You can really just kind of focus on the warmth warmth of the earth kind of filling you up. So instead of visualizing this, focusing more on the warming sensation. And then after connecting to the earth, you can go ahead and proceed with your whole manifestation, spell work, whatever it is that you're doing. And during that time, you are drawing upon that earth's energy in the spell work rather than your own personal energy. After the spell and ritual is done, you disconnect from the earth by drawing your roots back up from the center of the earth into your body thank the earth, and that is the simplest way to use an additional energy source outside of your own energy. The next energy source that we're going to talk about is the celestial realm, and this is probably going to be the biggest section because there is a lot that goes into this, but the celestial realm encompasses gods, goddesses, angelic beings, planetary spirits. If you are someone that works with planetary magic from a more atheist or agnostic perspective, this can also go into the celestial realm. And there are so many different ways to draw upon that energy. And it's really gonna vary on the types of beings that you're working with as well. Every god or goddess has a different invocation or evocation depending on your perspectives on that, as well as angelic beings. And within planetary magic, that can get just as complex 
I did do a planetary magic series for beginners and I also talked about my own personal planetary magic practice. You can find all of that linked on the main page of my YouTube channel. I think I have like four or five planetary magic videos or something like that. So I'm not really going to be diving too deep into planetary magic into this video at least, but I did want to talk about celestial energy as a whole and kind of how to tap into that energy. So it doesn't really matter what your beliefs are if you are a monotheist, a polytheist, maybe you are an agnostic person, you can still draw upon the celestial energy in similar ways. My favorite method is through the tree branch method, and that's just personally what I call it. I know that there are variations of this found in many books, many, many occult books, so this does not originate from me. I actually don't know who it originates from, but I call it the tree branch method because that's what it feels like to me. So what you would want to do for this tree branch method is you would want to start by centering your energy again. Some people like to ground to the earth as well, although you don't have to. And this technique does require visualization. So what you're going to do is kind of bring your attention to the top of your head, the crown, and you're going to visualize tree branches extending beyond your head up into the sky. And again, there are many meditations that can take you through something like this, but you want to start envisioning those branches reaching up towards the sky, sprouting new twigs, sprouting leaves. I mean, really try to get as visual as you can with something like this, but eventually you're going to reach the point where your tree branches reach the celestial realm. And you're going to envision drawing down that celestial energy through your tree branches, down the branches into your crown and entering the rest of your body. And I encourage you to actually kind of experiment with this a little bit. Try to do a grounding exercise where you are grounding yourself to earth energy and then try the tree branch exercise where you are extending up to the celestial realm and see how those two exercises feel to you. See if there's any sort of difference there. Because for me personally, when I am grounding to the earth, it feels very stable, it feels very warm. But when I'm tree branching up to the celestial realm, for me that feels very tingly and it feels quicker almost, whereas grounding to the earth feels like a slow and steady type energy. But that's my own personal experience, of course. So I definitely encourage you to try these two different exercises and see the difference. See how they make you feel. Find that out for yourself. But you can also bring different gods or goddesses or angelic beings or planetary spirits in by specific rituals. So if you have a particular god that you're working with, you're probably going to want to do some research and figure out what that sort of ritual looks like to bring that God into your ritual space to help power that spell. And you can also do something here like petitions as well. So let's say you're someone that doesn't enjoy visualization. You don't have to do the tree branch exercise. You can always do a petition as well. So a petition to some sort of God or goddess or angelic being, what that looks like is you literally sitting down, writing down on a piece of paper your intention, what it is that you are wanting to manifest and asking your guides, asking your gods, your goddesses, your angelic beings to assist you in this type of working. It's almost similar to prayer, but it's a little bit more action oriented because you're taking action by writing this petition down. And there's usually some sort of exchange that happens. You know, you are venerating that god or goddess or you are giving offerings. Again, it depends on the being that you're working with. But after the petition, you can do a little meditation with it, a little prayer, a little chant, whatever that looks like for you. And then you burn the petition. Petition. So that would be a way of simply asking those entities in the celestial realm for their assistance in your spell work. And I definitely encourage you to look more into magical timing as well. I could also put this into the category of the celestial realm, quite literally waiting for things to line up or certain energies to be brought in. I did do a video on magical timing that not only discusses planetary magic, but I talked about moon magic, seasonal magic, specific, you know, times of the year or times of the day. So I'm going to link that video below because it's a way of working with the macrocosm to help bring the microcosm and the macrocosm in sync. So I love working with the celestial realm because it's so versatile. You could look at it like it is the entire macrocosm. Obviously our perceptions of what the celestial realm is is going to differ depending on the practitioner. But definitely look into magical timings because that is another energy source that you can bring into spell work. The third energy source that we are going to talk about today is energy hubs. 
So I talked about energy hubs in one of my Let's Talk spell work videos, but energy hubs are different from energy vortexes and ley lines, and we're gonna be getting into energy vortexes and ley lines in the next one. Energy hubs are kind of on a smaller scale. There are specific events or moments where there is just heightened energy. So a great example of this would be at a riot or a protest or a concert. All of these events where there is a significant amount of energy from all the people around you. Emotions are being raised, maybe there's some physical exercise going on, and there's so much energy in that area that even if you were to skim a little bit of energy off the top, there would still be plenty of energy for everyone else. So if you're at a concert, take advantage of that energy and bring that into your spell work. Bring all that extra energy around you because not only do you have your own personal power going into this spell, you have the power of everything around you also fueling the spell. Keep in mind though, with energy hubs, that energy can be a little chaotic, just depending on what the event is. So obviously, if you're trying to do a love spell or something, doing that at a riot or a protest, it may not be the best time for that. It may not be the best type of energy. So you definitely wanna consider what the circumstances are, You know, the energy that's giving off around you. Is that really something that you want to bring into your spell work? Because energy hubs, again, are very chaotic and sometimes that's a good thing and then sometimes that's not something that you want to bring into your spell work at all so you really have to make sure that it does line up to your intention but for energy hubs this is my favorite technique I love the tendril technique and I think I've talked about this a couple times on my channel maybe maybe in like one video or something but what I like to do for the tendril technique is you begin by again centering your energy because that's always what we want to do when we start our energy manipulation and then you're going to bring your attention to your hands and you're going to start very visualizing these tendrils starting to come off of your fingers and spread further and further into the environment. This is actually a really great technique for just energy sensing in general. When you're trying to feel out an object or a person, place, or thing, you get the point. It's really, really great for sensing the whole environment. And this does take practice, by the way. This is something that if you are brand new to the tendril technique, you're probably going to want to do this over many weeks, just practicing each day bringing your tendrils a little bit further out away from your fingers. But eventually you'll get to the point where you're able to visualize these long tendrils coming off of your fingers and you want to allow the energy in the area to latch onto your tendrils. Really allow your tendrils to soak up that energy and then what you do is you draw those tendrils back into your hand and then you assess and you see, okay, is my hand really cold, tingly, warm? How am I feeling inside? Does this make me feel anxious? or does this make me feel calm, at peace? You know, what does what the energy feel like once you've brought it inside your body? And once you've made that assessment, you've determined it's something that you want to bring into your spell work, what you would do from there is proceed with your spell work in the energy hub and this doesn't have to look you know creepy or whatever you don't have to bring a whole altar with you and do your spell work at a concert you can simply have a coin in your pocket that you're drawing sigils on as the concert is playing so there's many different ways to be really discreet during energy hubs while still using that energy in spell work so get creative but again use those tendrils stretch those tendrils out into your environment allow that energy to latch onto your tendrils pull it into the body and then use that in your spell work funnel that energy into a talisman that you're creating or an amulet whatever it is that you're doing you're using that external energy to fuel that so whereas energy hubs more pertain to events that are happening around you energy vortexes and ley lines relate to locations around you so there is a lot of history and lore around ley lines and a lot of people say that they can be used for magical purposes because they are a source of massive power. They connect a lot of really big historical structures across the world. So an energy vortex would be like the Great Pyramids or Stonehenge or something similar. These are sites that have incredible power because of their historical associations, the mythology that goes into it, all the spiritual beliefs that surround it. And so these specific locations can be used in spell work as well. Now, not many of us have Stonehenge near us or the Great Pyramids or any of these other amazing world wonders, but you can look at ley lines and see if there is a specific ley line that is close to you as well. And I also 
wanted to bring up the subject of astrocartography here as well. This is something that I don't see a lot of people talking about, but it's essentially location-based astrology. What you do, it's so complicated and so goes beyond this video, but when you are born, there's basically this map of the world where certain points are said to be more beneficial for certain areas of your life. So like if you move to this destination, you'll have a lot more luck with love or something like that. It's actually really, really fascinating and I encourage everyone to get into astrocartography if you already have just some sort of basic understanding of your own birth chart. But you can kind of use this in the category of location-based energy sources because there are specific points in the world that may be personally powerful for you. So even if you don't have access to an energy vortex or you're not on a ley line or something, you can use astrocartography to see which points in the world are best for what as it pertains to you specifically. So if you look it up and you find that you're living in an area that's actually really, really great for your career, you can use the energy of that in any sort of career workings. So in that case, you might want to find a some sort of historical site in your area that has to do with careers and then do your spell work at that historical site. And if we're talking about locations just in general, you can always use the power of different locations such as crossroads. Crossroads are not really, I would not necessarily consider them an energy vortex per se, because to me, energy vortexes are these massive sites with a lot of extra energy. But I do feel that crossroads are a great example of location-based energy sources where there is specific symbolic elements to it that you can bring into your spell work. So if you're doing a road opener spell or something, or even some sort of baneful magic, you can do that at the crossroads as well. So definitely look into crossroad magic. It's really fascinating. But again, locations are also really important to consider as a energy source in your spell work. The fifth energy source that I would like to talk about is plant spirits and tree spirits. And this kind of even goes into mushrooms and the mycelium network beneath us. I did do a whole video on working with plant spirits and tree spirits, so I'm not really going to be going into all that in this video. I will just link it below. I'll just link all the videos below that I feel like pertains to what we're talking about here in this video today. But I love working with plant spirits and tree spirits. And even just tree spirits in general, there is so much that you can do with a tree at the roots, sitting at the base of the trunk, meditating, bringing that energy into spell work. I also like to use my house plants in spell work as well. You can see this plant right over here. This is one of my guardian wards actually. So this plant spirit and I have a really excellent relationship and this plant and I have a pact. We have a relationship where it is protecting my space. Using herbs in your spell work is another great way to connect with this energy source. And I mean actually connecting to the plant spirit when you are working with those herbs in your spell work. I'm not just talking about taking some rosemary and throwing it in a spell jar or grinding it up and then throwing it into something else. I'm talking about actually doing the work and connecting to that plant spirit. So again, I will link that plant spirit video down below if this is something that you're interested in because I think it's so important to really truly develop relationships with these plants. And it takes a long time to do that, you know? It's not, not a quick adventure. So I usually recommend to beginners, if you are brand new to working with plant spirits and tree spirits, just pick one. Pick one plant, one herb, one tree that you wanna try connecting with. Don't try to overwhelm yourself by learning an entire encyclopedia of herbs. I mean, you can do whatever you want, really. You don't have to listen to me if you don't want to, but I find it's much easier to develop these deep relationships when you're working with them one-on-one -on -one so you can really truly see how that plant makes you feel or how that tree makes you feel. Moving on to the sixth energy source, this is group work egregores. So even if you can just get one other person to do that spell with you to help funnel their energy into the spell work as well, you can accomplish some incredible things. I mean, that's why sometimes people are drawn to covens because you can do this massive group ritual work when you have the power of all these people behind it rather than just one person. And an egregore is a magical entity that arises out of the collective thoughts of the entire group. So let's say you have a whole group of magical practitioners and you are really focusing on one particular type of energy, that group can ultimately create an egregore for that specific intention because you have all of these collective thoughts being pushed into this energetic pool. Egregores are fascinating magical entities, but it really kind of poses the question, 
if it arises out of the collective ideas of all of these practitioners, what about non-magical practitioners? Are there energy sources that you can work with, egregores that we're talking about specifically, that are coming out of the collective unconscious? Maybe there is an idea or a thought form that you could work with that the community that you've lived in has really given their power to. And I don't want to totally get philosophical in a video like this, but it does open a lot of possibilities to work with these ideas that have now taken flight and become egregores from non-magical practitioners not even realizing that that's what they're creating in the first place. I mean, if you look at political movements, for example. See you later, Loki. Oh, nope, just kidding. Are you comfy? Okay. But if you look at certain political movements, there's obviously a very specific intention around those political movements, and it is a collective of people that are putting their energies together for a specific intention. Does that count as an egregore? There's a lot of arguments for both sides on that, and I can definitely see both sides. I don't think I have a hard opinion either way, whether it's an egregore or not, but I do think that we can tap into these collective ideas and use that power, use the power of the collective in our spell work. The last category that we're gonna talk about here before we get into some tethering techniques and what tethering is, basically surrounds packs with lesser entities and lesser spirits. So with the celestial realm, we are talking about gods, goddesses, these angelic beings or the planets and planetary energies, these big entities in the macrocosm. Now I'm kind of talking about lesser spirits. So things that fall into this category are saints, demons, ancestors, spirits around your house. I mean, we can talk about land spirits in here. We can talk about the Fae. Although the Fae, it's arguable whether they are lesser spirits or not, or whether they are in their own dimension, completely separate from us. There's a lot of different theories about the Fae. So I don't know if calling them lesser spirits is really appropriate here, but I'm basically putting spirits in this category that you can make packs and deals with and that it's very transactional. So they are not these giant beings like a god or a goddess, but they are a little bit less and you are able to have these transactional approaches when working with them. So it essentially looks like I give you this and you give me this type of situation. You would bring something to the entity and again it totally depends on who you're working with so I can't give specific details here, I can just kind of give generalized ideas. But whether you're working with a saint or whether you're working with one of your ancestors, whether you're working with a land spirit that you have started to develop the relationship with, I always recommend build that relationship first. Don't just go straight into working with a lesser spirit or a lesser being and expect to get stuff from them. <laughs> they are all very, very different and some of them are not going to want to help you at all. So I definitely recommend building that relationship first, giving offerings, doing some research to understand them, what they like, what they don't like. And if you feel energetically like you're starting to get a good response from them, you can ask for their help with whatever it is you're doing for your spell work. So this is kind of similar to petitioning a deity, but it is a lot more transactional because when you sit down to make a pact with this spirit, whatever this spirit is, you are essentially going to write out what you are willing to give for what you are hoping to get. And I did do a video recently with Justin, the Witch of Enchantment, and he talked about using saints in his practice and how that feels very transactional to him. And he also talked about how he goes about making these transactions with saints. And I thought it was really fascinating. But for me personally, I work with ancestors quite a bit and it is somewhat transactional, but there's also a lot of ancestral veneration that goes in here as well. So when I'm calling in my ancestors or a specific ancestor or whatever, and I'm wanting to make some sort of pact with them to have them help me with a specific task. I am asking for their guidance, or maybe I'm asking for their protection in some sort of working, or just their power to help fuel a healing spell. That's something that I've done before. And what I do in return is I do a something a little extra for them, because I'm gonna venerate my ancestors anyways. I'm going to honor them because they deserve that level of respect without me asking for anything in return. But if I do wanna ask for something, I want to give them something extra on top of my veneration practice. So maybe that's me talking about them in a video, kind of like how Justin, the Witch of Enchantment, was talking about working with Saint Expedite. One of the ways that he was working with his saints and making that transactional deal was to make a video about Saint Expedite so that everybody could know who this saint was. So I'm gonna link that video down below because that was an awesome video too. But there's so many different ways that you can go about making packs 
with these lesser entities. Maybe you have decided that you want to start working with some spirits that are on the land that you currently occupy. And maybe you start building that relationship by tending to the land, gardening, taking care of the soil, you know, planting some things to get the bees and the butterflies into the area, whatever that looks like for you in your region, whatever that looks like for you, of course, but maybe you start building that relationship by showing respect to the land so that the land spirits can see that you care. And then maybe six months to a year later, you have a really strong relationship with these land spirits. Maybe you're leaving some offerings for them because you've done some research on the land that you currently live on, who used to occupy this land, and some potential mythology or lore that goes along with this land. And so you found certain trinkets or food items or something that correlate with that, that you can give as an offering on your front doorstep or your back door. And then you finally come to a point where you have a good relationship and you want to ask for their help. Maybe you want them to aid you in home protection. Maybe you want to bring in their energy as a source to fuel your home protection spells to really kind of keep watch and keep guard over your house or your apartment, whatever it is that you live in. That is absolutely a possibility. And all you have to do is just ask. Ask, and you can also do some sort of divination as well here. Like if you're a little bit confused and you don't know what to offer or if it's even okay to ask, I love using tarot for this, but you can always find some sort of divination system that works for you. So if you like pendulum or scrying or whatever it is, but for me it's tarot. And when I'm unsure about how to proceed with some sort of entity or being that I'm working with, I will do a tarot reading so I can get a general feel for, is this spirit wanting me to proceed with the relationship? Are they giving me a yes or a no? It just helps give some better clarity. So I definitely recommend using divination here. So we've covered seven different major energy sources that you can use in your spell work. Let's talk about tethering. What even is tethering and why do we care? Usually when we are performing spells, and I always say this, or I try to say it as much as I can in my videos, that spells constantly need life being pushed into them to keep them alive. If you do a spell jar and sit it on your counter or your windowsill or whatever, walk away, and then never touch that spell jar again, eventually it will get to a point where the energy has died off and it's going to no longer be effective. We do need to be continuously pushing energy into our spell work to keep it alive while it's manifesting. So money bowls are another great example. I love money bowls. I talk about them all the time on this channel, but I feed my money bowl with my own energy every Thursday to keep it alive, to keep that energy moving because I wanna bring money in, right? I do not want it to get stagnant and I don't want it to die off. So what do you do when you have all these spells that you're doing or even just one spell in particular and you're not able to feed it regularly with your own energy? Let's say that you're a person, it's not going to work for you for every Thursday for you to sit down and feed a money bowl. Sometimes it's just not realistic to be continuously feeding energy into these spells. So what you can do is you can tether your spell work to another energy source. That way you don't have to be using your own personal energy to continuously power the spell. So how do you go about tethering? There are so many different ways to tether and there is no way that I can possibly cover all the techniques in this video. And honestly, you're just going to have to get creative. But let's say, for example, you have a statue like this and you want to turn it into a guardian ward to help aid in protection. Let's say you want this statue to stand guard in one of your rooms to really help protect the environment from negative energies or unwanted spirits or whatever it is. So you've got this guardian ward, you've set it all up through your normal spell crafting process. How do you keep this item charged? Because you're definitely going to want to have energy continuously fed into it. So I typically like using either the earth or the celestial realm for tethering things. I find that those two energy sources are the most stable for me in particular in my own magical practice. And you can do this many different ways. So like if you're working with the earth energy source, you would visualize those tendrils sprouting from the, in this case, a dragon statue and going deep into the earth's crust and really kind of bind that in your mind and do a whole meditation, go into an altered state of consciousness and tether this item to the earth's core. If you want to use the celestial realm, you can bring in a specific god or goddess or a planetary energy into this spell work and ask for its assistance in keeping this spell work alive and going. So you could do the tree branching exercise and tether it that way to the celestial realm, or you can do some sort of prayer or invocation or evocation to your gods, whatever it is that you personally believe in, to keep this tied to them. Or let's say you're working with a goddess 
that is associated with keys. Can you guess who I'm talking about right now? But they are associated with keys. And so you would take one of the keys that you have designated to your goddess that you have already consecrated for the specific purpose of working with that goddess. And you only use this specific key when you need to work with that goddess. What you can do is put that key in your spell work. So you are now tethering that spell work to that particular goddess. And so you have this energetic link there. But again, there's so many different ways to tether things. You're just gonna have to look at the energy source that calls out to you the most for the particular spell that you're working on and figure out how to link it. What, it, what symbolic link can you use in your spell work? Is it a physical item that relates to that planet, god or goddess or the earth or whatever that you can include in your spell work? Is it more of a visual Visualization me method where you're using the earth grounding technique or the tree branching technique? Are you using tendrils? You know, it is totally up to your discretion. In my personal opinion, there's no right or wrong way to tether a spell because it's so creative. But I will say, if you find that your spells are kind of dying off over time, let's say it was really strong in the beginning and the effects are just kind of starting to die off, I would recommend re-tethering it, trying a different technique, putting your own personal power into it. It's like a science experiment you know be your own scientist take good notes and figure out what techniques work best for you I hope this video sparked lots of new ideas and inspiration for you definitely let me know your thoughts in the comments below I appreciate you all so much for watching this video and I will see you in another video soon bye